So it is possible to force a non-spontaneous redox reaction. So normally, one thing would be able to take electrons from the other, but never the other way around. However, remember, redox is the flow of electrons, so if we use current, if we use a power source to drive electrons backwards, so if we actually force them to go from one thing to the other, we can cause a non-spontaneous redox reaction to occur. So we take two electrodes that we hook up to a positive and negative power source, and we immerse those electrodes in a molten salt, so a melted salt, or an electrolytic solution. So that means we take a salt, we either melt it, or we dissolve it in water. So it's either aqueous or liquid. And then the anode that's in the solution, the anode is going to be the one then that takes the electrons from the species in the solution. So the anode is going to take away electrons. The cathode, on the other hand, is going to give away electrons. So it's a little bit backwards in the galvanic cell. In the case of a galvanic cell, the anode loses electron, electrons, cathode takes those electrons. In the case of electrolytic cell, the anode is the one that is taking the electrons, and the cathode is the one that is giving the electrons. So here's an example, and this would be how they generate pure sodium. So if you think of sodium, it's an alkali metal that reacts with moisture in the air, so it's never found in the pure form in uh, nature. However, they can make it in the laboratory using electrolysis. So right here we have a vat full of molten NaCl, which is salt that they've melted down, so it's going to be very, very hot. Then they hook it up to a power source. Think of this power source as kind of like a pump that's going to pump the electrons from one side to the other. So the anode then is going to take electrons from something and pump them through to the cathode. In this case, it's going to take them from the Cl minus. So the negative charge right there means it has extra electrons. So it's going to take those electrons and generate Cl2 gas. That's what those little bubbles are. The electrons that it takes are going to flow through over to this side. They're going to join with the sodium to make sodium liquid. So that would be pure sodium right there. And this is a non-spontaneous reaction. If you were to mix Na and Cl, you get salt. If you mix sodium and chlorine, you would also get salt. It would react backwards to this, so sodium would give an electron to chlorine. However, with the use of this direct current with that pump, we're able to remove the electrons back from chlorine and give them back onto sodium and generate something that otherwise wouldn't happen naturally. Okay, so that was a molten species. When we deal with an aqueous species, well, we've got something else in there. If it's aqueous, that means we have the solid and we have water. So that's a concern because water can also react. So with electrolysis, something's going to be reduced, something's going to be oxidized. When we look at the reduction, so that's the gain of electrons, there's two things that can be, can, can be reduced. The cation, so in the case of sodium iod or calcium iodide, the calcium could be reduced, or the water that's in there could also be reduced. It depends on who is the has the better reduction potential. Now, there's other species in the solution, like the I-. minus. However, that's not going to be reduced. It's already negative, and so therefore it's not going to take on any more electrons. So we just look at the calcium and the water. <clears throat> so to figure out which one it's going to be, we have to distinguish who is the more positive number. So you go to your SERP table again, so we compare calcium and water. In this case, water has the more positive number, which means it's going to be higher on the list. Therefore, it will be the one that is going to be reduced. So this reaction will not occur. So that leaves us with water, so here is our reduction half reaction. Now we've got to go down to oxidation, so the loss of the electrons. Once again, there's two species that this can happen to. It can happen to the iodine, losing its negative, or it can happen to the water. In this case, they flip both the reactions so we can see the oxidation happening, and if we flip the reaction, those should both be flipped, so this should be a negative 0.53 and this should be a negative 1.23 since they're flipped. And so then same deal, that then we would be looking at the oxidation potential, and we want to go with the higher of the two numbers. And so that's going to be the negative 0.53 volts. So out of our four possible half reactions, it's going to be the H2O and the iodine that the reaction is going to occur for. So this would be one half reaction, that would be the other. And we can combine those two half reactions down uh, just by melting them together and canceling out things that are common. And in this case, they both have the two electrons being lost and gained, so those will cancel out. So then the overall reaction would just be the combination of the two. And so then this would be our overall electrolysis reaction. So keep in mind, this would be a non-spontaneous reaction, but since we're driving it with an electrical current, this will occur. Now the way we're going to observe this is we're going to have H2, which is a gas, so we're going to see bubbles being given off from the gas. 
Uh, we're generating OH minus, which is basic, so that means the solution is going to become more basic over time. And then we're going to be making I2, which is a solid. So we're going to see all uh, three of those being generated in this if we drive it with an electrical current. So then here's a model of what this would look like. At the anode, we're going to be taking the electrons away from the iodines and forming iodine solids so that we get plated onto this electrode. Electrons are going to be driven over or pumped over to the cathode where they're going to attach themselves to the OH minus, or I'm sorry, to the waters, thus generating OH minus and H2 gas. And so you're going to see bubbles from the H2 gas. If we were to put an indicator in here or a pH probe, we would see the solution's pH increasing as it becomes more basic. All right, so let's do another practice problem. This one we're going to apply a direct current, which means we're going to be doing an electrolysis problem to an aqueous copper tube bromide solution. So if it's aqueous, what are the different things that are going to be inside of the solution? Well, the copper 2, that means you're going to have Cu2 pluses in there. The bromide, that means you're going to have some Br minus. And then the aqueous means that you're also going to have water in there. So those are our three players. We're going to need to figure out who's going to be oxidized and who's going to be reduced, choosing between those three. All right, so let's do reduction first. The reduction is the gain of electrons, and all four of these show the gain of electrons so they can stay just as they are. So for uh, this first one, we've got H2O, so that's a potential one showing water being reduced, make H2 an OH minus. And then if we look down here, we've got Cu2 plus turning into two electrons, so that's our other choice. We also have Br2 here, but Br2 is not one of our choices. Br minus is, but this reaction shows it as a product. So there's no way to get Br minus to be reduced. Even if we were to flip that, it wouldn't show a reduction. It would show an oxidation reaction. So of those two choices, then, we want to pick the one that's the most positive, which is going to wind up being our copper 2 plus 1. And so that means this is going to be the reduction half reaction of choice. Water has a lower reduction potential, so that will not occur. Copper will be reduced first. For our oxidation half reaction, we're going to need to flip the equations to see those. So let's just look on the product side to see which ones are in our reaction. So our second one right there, we've got water, and we're showing water losing four electrons, which would be oxidation. And right down here, we have Br minus, and we're showing Br minus losing two electrons. So those would be our two options right there. Now, if we wanted to flip those, that means that this would be a negative 1.23 and this would be a negative 1.07. So the more positive of those two is going to be this one right here, the Br2 reaction, or Br minus reaction, and so that means that would be our oxidation half reaction. So then let's combine those down into an overall reaction for C, and in this case, uh, we're once again, we're gonna be flipping this one right there, so just mentally imagine that flipped, and that means these two electrons are going to cancel out those two, and our overall reaction is going to be Cu2 plus reacting with two Br minuses to produce Cu2 plus plus Br2 liquid. I'm sorry, that's not going to be Cu2 plus, that'll be copper solid. So in this case, we're going to generate solid copper and bromine liquid. And now finally, let's calculate the delta G for this reaction. And so there's our delta G equation. It looks like we're going to have to get the E of the cell before we go any farther. So let's do that real quick. So the E of this particular cell is just going to be the two oxidation potentials, reduction potentials added together. So copper, that one stays as written, so it's going to stay at 0.34 volts. But then our bromine reaction, remember we flipped that one, and so it became a negative 1.07. So this is plus a negative 1.07 volts. And for our voltage here then we are going to get a negative number, a negative 0.73 volts, which once again indicates this is a non-spontaneous reaction. That's why we have to use electricity to drive it to cause it to occur. So now we can plug numbers into our equation to get our delta G. So number of moles of electrons transferred is two in either case, so we don't need to balance anything there. So it's going to be two and it's going to be times Faraday's constant, which is 96,500 coulombs per electron. And then we need to throw our 0.73 volts on there. And remember, volts is the same thing as joules per coulomb. And so that means our coulombs are going to cancel out coulombs, 
and we're going to be left with joules. I should have wrote that in there. And then, of course, this is moles of electrons, so that's going to cancel out that. And we can get our final value, and I'm just going to go ahead and put it into kilojoules, so it's an easier number. It's going to be 140 kilojoules. Since this is for a reaction, it's going to be kilojoules per mole. And as is expected, this is a positive number, and a positive delta G means a non-spontaneous reaction. So this process is actually used industrially to refine metals. So if you want some copper, you can't just go out and find a chunk of copper laying in the ground in a mountain somewhere. It's going to be mixed with other things. And so a way we can purify copper is we take a copper-containing compound and we use electrolysis to refine it. So let's say, for example, we have some copper bromide. We can take that, run it through electrolysis, and we can generate that copper metal. That can then be melted down, turned into wires, turned into sheeting, and sold. So a very common calculation then is going to have us determining how long it would take for a certain amount of a pure metal to be deposited on an electrode. Good news is, it's just a stoichiometry problem. Bad news is, it uses some new conversion factors that we've got to learn. Alright, so if you've got a silver solution, question is, how long would it take to deposit 3.56 grams of silver from an AG plus solution when we're applying a current of 2.5 amps. And so our starting point in this case is going to be the 3.56 grams. And let's uh, break down some of these numbers. So 2.5 amps. Remember, amps is coulombs per second. And so this is the same way of saying there's going to be 2.5 coulombs for every one second that goes by. That'll be great because that'll help us convert this into time. Okay, and from grams, we're going to want to put that into moles. And so we'll just take the molar mass of silver, which is 107.87 grams for every one mole. And in this case, in order to generate one mole of silver, we're going to need one mole of electrons. How do I know we need one mole of electrons? Well, because Ag plus is going to need one electron to become Ag solid. So if we have a mole of Ag pluses, we're going to need a mole of electrons. So for every one mole of Ag, we're going to need one mole of electrons. Just a side note real quick. So let's say we were refining Cu2+. In this case, it would be two moles of electrons for every one mole of silver. So right now, we've canceled out grams. We've canceled out moles of silver. We're left with moles of electrons. So we're going to need to get this into charge. Is there a way we can convert charge into electrons or electrons into charge? You bet Faraday's constant. So Faraday's constant says that there's 96,500 coulombs for every one mole of electrons. So we have gotten rid of moles of electrons, and we have gotten ourselves to coulombs, which means we can convert that into time. And so our next step then would be to say, well, there's 2.5 coulombs for every one second that passes. And we got that from our amperage. And so coulombs cancels out coulombs, and we're left with seconds. Uh, just because we don't want to be left with seconds, let's bring that to minutes. And so we're going to multiply it by 60 seconds for every one minute. That way seconds cancels out seconds, and we can solve. And then our final answer turns out to be 21 minutes. I don't know why I wrote the moles there. That should be minutes. So there we go. With this amount of current applied, we would generate 3.56 grams of silver in about 21 minutes. Now here's another way they might ask it. They refer to 2.0 Faradays. So when they say things like that, and you'll see that 1.5 Faradays, 3 Faradays, all that is is just Faraday's constant times 2. So it's going to be 2 times 96,500 coulombs per mole of electrons. So if we think of this then, if there is 96,500 coulombs for every 1 mole of electrons, if we have 2 times that right there, Really, that means we're starting with two moles of electrons. So two Faradays, two moles of electrons. And then we can say uh, one mole of silver for every one mole of electrons. Let's cancel each other out. And then we'll just do 107.87 grams for every one mole of silver. And moles of silver cancel out moles of silver. And what we would find is with two Faradays, we would generate about 215.74 grams of silver.